We're talking today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive with band leader and drummer Hal Smith here in Chautauqua, New York. And thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. We were talking before the cameras were rolling about your current state of flux. <laughs> you just moved and you're on your way to Europe. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Europe for you? It's a three-week tour of playing medical trade shows. No kidding. Where doctors and uh, company representatives from pharmaceutical companies discuss new products and the uh, agent who brought the band over discusses creativity in marketing the products and to illustrate, illustrate creativity, he has a jazz band there to improvise. I'm fascinated by that. That's Me too. really interesting. It is. And this is the fourth year I've been doing these tours. And who do you take with you? Or you just I'm a sideman on this one. Uh huh. Which is great when you go overseas. You don't have to worry about any of the leaders problems. You're wow. just a sideman. Yeah. But I'm working for Tim Laughlin, who's a mm -hmm. great clarinetist from New Orleans and a protege of Pete Fountain. So how do they he works into his presentation the idea of improvising or yes. ensemble. This is a new product. You can market it to the public this way, and if that doesn't work, think on your feet, just like this jazz band's about yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. And it works almost every time. That's great. And I've gone over a couple times with my own group, the California Swing Cats, uh -huh. for the same company, but different products each time. So you're playing... Um, in Germany? Switzerland this time. In Switzerland? Yes. Is it mostly for Swiss people or is it a kind of a big conference where people come from? No, it will be Swiss medical people uh -huh. almost exclusively and maybe a couple from Austria or Germany or uh, neighboring countries because some of them have heard the bands before and they like to be invited <clears throat> to these trend meetings they call them so they can hear the band again. Yeah. We've even seen some of them at performances over here when they come to the States so come to New Orleans or somewhere and make a point to look up mm -hmm. the musicians they've heard. That's great. That's great that they pick jazz to do it too. Yes, it sure is. Of, well, I don't know what else they would pick. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't even put the idea in their mind. I'm not. Well, you started out, um, did, was drums your first no. instrument? No, that's what I wound up on. Yeah. Started with banjo, then piano, clarinet, trombone, I'd probably still be playing that if I didn't uh, have to have braces. Uh -huh. And drums was something convenient to play that your teeth can be bound up and it doesn't really matter. And I just stayed with drums. Yeah. With a crystal ball, I'd go back and yeah. play trombone. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. A little bit easier to move around. That doesn't bother me at all. No. I just like the trombone and uh, I have a way I'd, I'd like to hear it sound. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't hear it that often and I, I wish I could do it. Yeah, there's not a lot of um, young trombone players out there right now. It doesn't seem like the, the instrument is that much in fashion. Not in the traditional and swing uh, mode. Mm -hmm. there, there are some fine modern players or clinicians, but not uh, fellows who play it in the real old yeah. style. I see you had uh, some association with Jake Hanna. Yes, early on. sure did. Not too early, really. I'd been playing quite a while before I took lessons from him. Uh huh. And I, uh, my early studies were with a pretty generic drum teacher, who said you you play a quarter note this way and do this this way and do that that way. But despite that, he still told me some wrong techniques, and it took Jake Hanna to turn my technique around. Did I'd you, still be playing wrong. Did you have the? I never played the, matched grip, uh -huh. but I didn't have my left hand far enough over like the old time drummers did. And that's the first thing Jay Canna said. Nope, not far enough over. Uh -huh. I can't do that. I can't. Mm -hmm. It took forever, but I'm, I'm glad. But I, I've picked up a lot, not so much from the lessons as just from watching him play, watching the techniques he uses and how he tunes the drums and the height he sits and where he has his equipment and all that. Mm -hmm. That was as useful to me as the lessons. He's still playing. Sure yeah. is. In fact, I think we're going to see him in a couple weeks. I hope so. In Aspen. He, he's absolutely terrific player. Could play in any style band and, and make it sound better than uh -huh. it already does. Who else were, was influencing you when you were coming, you know, developing on the drums? Nick Fatul was one who was uh, comfortable in, in either a studio setting or a swing band or a big band. 
uh, or a lot of Dixieland bands mm -hmm. with Maddie Matlock, Eddie Miller, Dick Cathcart, the people who played in Southern California, uh, such as on the soundtrack of Pete Kelly's Blues and uh, yeah. oh, Maddie Matlock's Paducah Patrol and the Rampart Street Paraders. And I think, Nick Fatul, if you took a survey of musicians, maybe 20 musicians like the ones here this weekend and said, who's your favorite drummer? Probably 18 of them would say Nick Fatul. No kidding. Yeah, because he just is such a marvelous uh, technician, but he doesn't let it get in the way of swinging, uh -huh. and he's always got perfect taste. If you had to, tough question number one, okay. Got a young drummer defining swing. Can you do it in words? Mm. It's a feeling of uh, lightness and elasticity and working with the other members of the rhythm section where it's a, it's a joint effort to move forward but it's not tense. It doesn't fall back on the beat. It can get in a groove, mm -hmm. but it doesn't just sit there. It keeps moving, but uh, not, not too far ahead and not too far behind. That's mm -hmm. the ideal, I think. Playing ahead of the beat and playing behind the beat, is, is, is this something that exists for you? Sure. This concept? Depending okay. on, on the band. I try to scope out a rhythm section right away, and if I can hear one guy if the bass is turned way up and he's going to have it his way or no way, I'm not going to fight him uh -huh. because then we're going to drown out everybody on the horns and they're yeah. going to be mad at both of us. Yeah. So I'll try and work with him. Yeah. Um, if he's going to work with me or if there's no amp, if everybody's trying to make a, a group effort out of it, then sometimes I'll lead the way. I have to know who I'm working with. If it's people I don't work with all the time, like Dave McKenna this weekend, I haven't worked with him for a long time, I listen to him. I didn't want to put my foot on his chest and say, okay, here's where it is. I don't want him to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, If it's someone I work with all the time, they know what I do anyway, and they're, they're probably going to wait for me to uh, yeah. lay it down. Bass players, um, do they tend to try to work with you uh, like the gentleman that you have working with this weekend? Do you feel that the two of them are any different? Well, I haven't played with Michael Moore yet. I will do that tonight. Oh. And I've only played with him once, and that was at this jazz party when it was still in, in Pennsylvania, uh -huh. about 1985. But that won't be any problem. Yeah. He's a real light bass He's player. He's very light. Just, uh, uh, it's going to work out fine. I have no question. You know, the difference will be the piano, because Dave Frischberg was on the original recording that we're supposed to be recreating. So of course he's not here, and there's no drums on the recording. So I'm going to be a real outlander there. Uh -huh. But I'm not going to take charge of that rhythm section. I'm yeah. going to let, let those guys play as they would without a drummer and just try and play lightly in the background. Mm -hmm. With Bob Haggard, though, he lays down. He picks the time. So I've gone with him all weekend. That acoustic guitar makes a big difference, too. In the, it really does. It's such a, we almost forget how tied that was to the bassy thing. That yes. And not chunk, just chunk, Basie, chunk. Uh, Eddie Condon. Mm -hmm. uh, people forget what a good guitar player he was. Mm -hmm. Not a soloist, but the time was as perfect as it could get. And it's a, it's a lost art now. It yeah. really is, except at uh, functions like this. Big bands don't use rhythm guitar anymore. Yeah. It seems to be something about the acoustic thing, too. Yeah. Because it's percussive. Yes, it is. It's almost like you're not hearing the chord as much as you are the, almost the washboard effect. Really. It depends on who's playing it. Uh -huh. uh, some players mute the strings, some let them ring. Uh, with Marty Gross, you hear the ring of the strings, which is nice. Like That's the way Eddie Condon played. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Rebecca Kilgore, she lets the strings ring. And it's just a nice blend, especially with an acoustic bass, if, if there's not lots of miking. Yeah. That that guitar can you can key everything on the rhythm guitar. Yeah. You sure don't want to be fighting that if it's playing all four beats. <laughs> right. It's easier for me to back off a little bit than for the guitar, so yeah. you don't have have that. And uh, those two are two of the easiest to work with I can think of. Um, you were born in '53. Yes. How come you didn't go the rock and roll route? 
When I was a kid, I was growing up at the very end of the Dixieland revival. So the started by Lou Waters, Turk Murphy, including Bunk Johnson, uh, Kid Ory. Mm -hmm. And the second wave of that was honky tonk piano and banjo, barbershop quartets. That was real popular when I was a kid. All over the radio, on the TV. In Indianapolis? Everywhere. Because we're similar in age. I'm a little older than you, but I was not aware that there was a revival of Dixieland. Well, it was all. more pronounced in California. Uh -huh. uh, that was the hotbed of it, the Bay Area and Los Angeles to a lesser degree. But the uh, bands that made it big, banjo bands or uh, pianists who'd have a hit single, Crazy Otto, Johnny Maddox, uh, Joe Fingers Carr, people like that, you could hear those things on the radio very easily. And, and there were lots of recordings of Waiting for the Robert E. Lee, Alabama Jubilee, things like that. I mean. I could walk into any record store in Indianapolis and find those things. Oh, so it was just kind of a happy music, and it wasn't a protest music like rock and roll. I, I heard Elvis Presley. I remember Bill Haley in the Comets and mm -hmm. all that. It just never did anything for me. And I liked ragtime and, and the banjo music and all that kind of thing. And that's what led me into an appreciation of Dixieland when I finally I heard the Firehouse Five at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. when we'd moved to California when I was eight. Yeah. And I was taken to Disneyland for my birthday, first live jazz band I ever heard. I said, that's it. <laughs> that wiped out everything I'd heard before. Wow, and you were playing at that time. Which instrument were you playing? I was not settled on anything. Uh -huh. I had gone from piano to banjo. I was playing clarinet, just reading out of the exercise book at that point. Mm -hmm. And I heard that, and the trombone got my... Uh, oh. Uh, imagination and I really wanted to play that but then the braces came. What was your parents musical tastes like? Uh, they liked older popular music. I mean they were not jazz fans, record collectors with a copy of Brian Rust. Oh yeah that was recorded by Bix and Red Nichols and uh -huh. they just if it was good and well played they liked it. Uh -huh. So when they when I got an interest in the older forms of, of ragtime and, and things like that they were ready for that, and they, they liked it because they'd grown up during the swing era, which was just an extension of that, if, if you want to think of it in sure. a straight line. Uh, my dad was a pianist, just a hobby pianist, not a professional, but he had records of Jelly Roll Morton and Fats Waller, and, and I heard those things. They just they didn't get through to me until years later. But generally, if I liked it, they'd like it, mm -hmm. and they were real supportive of uh, my uh, goals and taking me to hear live jazz whenever yeah. possible. That was a problem though. In California, you have to be 21 to get into a club and they card like crazy. Mm -hmm. And you can't sneak in and drink a Coke. So mm -hmm. unless something came to Disneyland or an outdoor concert or a pizza parlor or something like that, I right. couldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the New York and Chicago musicians didn't come out. Uh, Eddie Condon brought Pee Wee Russell to Disneyland the year I didn't go. I never heard either one of them in person. Oh. I missed um, a lot of the people, Max Kuminski, Muggsy Spanier, uh, Gene Krupa. I hardly heard any of the swing era drummers in person. Very oh, few. Ben Pollock. I heard Pollock. Yeah. The first time, first jazz festival I went to was Dixieland at Disneyland in 1964. Pollock had a band there. Yeah. And through suppressed memory, now I remember what he sounded like. At the time, <laughs> it was too much for me to absorb, but yeah. I'm thinking back on it, I'm remembering the details of what he played. And the more I hear him on, right. on recording and tape, I remember what he did. Some of those guys didn't even, they had a different way of setting up their drums, didn't they? They sure did, yeah. Uh, the older players tended to use larger bass drums and maybe two tom-toms. Uh, floor tom, two mounted toms, wood block, two cowbells and the cymbals down low, snare drum tilted way over, uh -huh. which is a holdover from marching bands. Oh. When it's slung over your shoulder, you play oh, yeah. like you would in a military band. But all the Chicago drummers learned rudiments and classical technique from drummers who had come out of that military and classical tradition. So they played like that and lifted their sticks way high off mm -hmm. the, uh, the drum and all that. And I still tilt mine. Yeah. Over. It's much easier to play. I can't play it the other uh -huh. way now. Do you recall seeing the 
I think it's the Glenn Miller movie. And ben Pollock is in it. He sure is, and the Benny Goodman story, too. He's in both of those. And he plays closed roles yeah. in the hi-hat. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and a cool. stick on the bass drum. That's a technique you uh -huh. don't see too much anymore. Yeah. Keep a four beat going on the bass drum and play a little syncopation against it with either the left or the oh. right stick. I do that this weekend, but with that 18 inch bass <laughs> drum, I'll drop a stick <laughs> reaching for it. Well, gosh, you have a pretty good list of uh, well-known names you've played with. Milt Hinton and mm -hmm. Bob Wilbur, all those guys. How did that, was that most of you at festivals? That Mostly things, things like this, yeah. like the jazz party where it's a mix and match. It'll be mm -hmm. one uh, person hiring everybody who'll put together a set of musicians he thinks will work well together. 99% of the time they do. But that's where I've gotten to work with uh, really great players like that. Yeah. Because they, you know, they travel in their own circles. And if they're going to need a drummer, they're going to call someone they were comfortable with, who they work with all the time. But that's the great advantage for me, having played these things. I get to work with them where I probably wouldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. If I've been half a continent away, you know, I'm not in New York where I'm going to see them all the time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have had those uh, chances. You ever had a circumstance uh, where it's been like a train wreck? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are <laughs> sure you sure you have. want to think about that? <laughs> <laughs> and is it usually something inherent in the rhythm section that's not, like you said, someone's trying to dominate or just not? No, because I haven't had many train wrecks with rhythm section mm. players. It's been the horn players oh. who tell you one thing and then they forgot they told you that. Oh. Or they want to control the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it wasn't a train wreck, but it was a very nerve-wracking experience. I played with an individual who shall remain nameless, mm -hmm. who was feature billed with uh, another swing era musician who shall also remain nameless, and there was a slight battle of the egos before the concert, and it translated into mm -hmm. uh, telling the rhythm section how to play, yeah. and nothing we did was right. And uh, I, one of these guys has written extensively about Dave Tuff, who's one of my great heroes mm -hmm. in the drums. I thought, here's my chance. Dave Tuff, that's what I'm going to do all night. So I tried to play real subtly on the first tune. He waved it to a halt and he said, play like you're playing in a 200-piece band. Oh, wow. You know, he stopped the tune, did that? Oof. Yeah. Was so, this in a club? Or was it, was it a concert? A... Oh, God. So. <laughs> I did. I played uh, like I was building a house, and uh, that's, that's what he wanted. But then I heard a, another concert later where he was complaining about all drummers are house builders. I said, I was only following so, orders. There you go. What are you going to do? But then for every experience like that, there's Doc Cheatham or Milt Hinton. Yeah. And you just, you know, you walk off the bandstand thinking, boy, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. So. They make up for it. Yeah. You've been um, involved in some jazz education projects? Yes. Uh, uh, San Diego, the America's Finest City Dixieland Jazz Society, has an adult jazz camp with uh, instruction on cornet, trombone, reeds, piano, banjo, bass instruments, and drums. And I've done one of those, was scheduled for a second, and then had to go on one of these tours, so I missed it. Uh -huh but I'll be doing it again this coming January. And I just, I teach the older techniques, New Orleans, uh, Chicago, and the San Francisco, New Orleans revival style that I mentioned earlier. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because is there a discernible difference between what happened to New Orleans jazz when it moved up to Chicago? Mm -hmm. There sure is. The New Orleans players who kept playing it in Chicago influenced the people in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Chicago tradition was largely the dance band. Uh, hotel bands, dance bands, ragtime players, and when King Oliver's band went to Chicago, and before that Freddie Keppard with the original Creole band, it just showed a whole new way of playing. Things. I, for instance, I would doubt that there were a lot of bass players around Chicago who plucked the instrument 
they probably bowed like every other bassist did until Bill Johnson went there in the uh, before World War I with Freddie Keppard and uh, the original Creole band. And he was a sensation, featured, had a feature number, Weary Blues, where he'd play chorus after chorus of slapped string bass. Uh -huh. So if you figure that's 1911 or 1913, that would turn the whole town over. Wow. And I think the New Orleans, the Oliver and Armstrong, Johnny Dodds, Jimmy Noon, Baby Dodds, each of those people, and Jelly Roll Morton, they'd have an influence on the Chicago style that I think set a real course for it until Earl Hines and Bix changed it again. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there, there probably wouldn't be a Chicago jazz had it not been for the New Orleans players going there because that's, that's what really turned on a lot of those players. And the yeah. interviews with Goodman and uh, Sullivan and Tuff and all those guys, they said, well, my influence was, and in almost every case it's Jimmy a New Newman Orleans musician. Guys, yeah. yeah, right. Don't you kind of wish you could have, you could go back in time and witness some of that interaction? I'm ready. Yeah. I'll go right now. I know. I sometimes feel like maybe we are born in the wrong era. I feel that way about 20 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that, I don't know if there's an answer to this question, but it seems that the music, the mainstream and the Dixieland is predominantly played by white players. Yes. And, and the audience for it too. Yes. And um, I sometimes wonder why. I wish I knew. Yeah. Uh, if it's a matter of making money, I can understand because mm -hmm. I don't know any wealthy uh, jazz musicians. Yeah. And you can, uh, but I don't know lots of white musicians who play blues or soul who have over overseas tours and make lots of recordings. Yeah, and uh, that's true. You know, it, I think it's a matter of going where the money is, and I, I can't blame any, anyone for that. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more black players, but the ones who play it tend to like really more modern styles, mainstream and beyond, rather than the earlier styles. Right. I guess the Joshua Redman and, and Christian McBride and that, those young younger players, they, they do standards, but then they're more into, I guess, <clears throat> their own yeah. music, kind of breaking, I don't know if they're breaking ground or not, but... They probably are, and they, I think there's a number of musicians who play traditional jazz in concerts and tours and make recordings, but given their choice of what to play, that would not be what they want to play. Mm -hmm. they, they can make a certain good living doing that, but that's not their music. Mm -hmm. And I've witnessed that time and again. Then there, are, I know a trombone player in New Orleans, Freddie Lonzo, who is uh, one of the few black players I've heard who really digs into the style and likes the style and does is not on the bandstand like, oh, I guess I'll get off soon. Yeah. And I, I wish it wasn't that way. It was, it's not been that way in the past, not until well into the 50s in the bebop era. I mean, we look at photos of jam sessions at Jimmy Ryan's in the late 30s and 40s. I mean, it's, it's a total mixture. Yeah. It's like nobody gave a second thought to that kind of thing, and it, it didn't really, uh, become that way until recent times, mm. that I can tell. I mean, I like playing, I've played where I've been the only white in the band, and I've been the drummer. And if there's a hot seat in, in an <laughs> yeah. all-black band, it's the drummer. But I had a ball, uh -huh. and the guys liked it. I thought, I'm gonna play for them, I'm not gonna play what I think will work here. I tried that, it failed miserably. It, it was a supposed traditional jazz band. Uh -huh. And um, I could hear a lot of swing influence in the, in the players, but not not the older style. The older style just didn't work. It didn't set them off. So I thought, all right, forget those people out there who are going to give me dirty looks in the audience. I'll just play what they want. So I uh -huh. laid in the rim shots and the ride cymbal and took off. Yeah. And I was accepted. You know, and the next time I showed up, they were all, hey, welcome back, man. So I just Great. play for the band. Right. And I know the people in the audience thought, well, that's not the, the correct setup that we want to see. What's that guy doing there? Mm -hmm. But I was there, I just made the best of it. Yeah. But I, I have no problem with, with uh, I mean, you can't make that a racial thing. You, if you make it into that, you're going to have a very unhappy bandstand. Uh -huh. There's just no point in it. Right. 
Why back to New Orleans? Six nights a week of no work. No kidding. Yes, from two nights a week to six nights a week. Are you lined up for that kind of work when you get back? Or you just yeah, know I it's took there? off from it to do this. I see. I mean, I actually started full time on August 29th. I see. And it's uh, really my best friend in music, Chris Tile, who's uh -huh. a trumpet player and uh, cornet player. Yeah. He's got a band called the Silverleaf Jazz Band at the uh, Royal Sinesta Hotel in the Can Can Jazz Cafe. Hmm. And it's I may get in trouble for saying this. I think it's the only authentic New Orleans style band in the city that really plays the music of King Oliver and Jelly Roll Morton, Armand Perone, Freddie Keppard, and plays it the way it's meant to be played and not with modern chords and ride cymbal and all that. It's very authentic. Wow. And well, it's good six for you. That should week. be doing what you want. It is. Yeah. I really I like that because he doesn't let it get boring. Uh -huh. I mean, he'll bring in new tunes to play and drop the ones that he's played a lot. And, and he's so versatile on the cornet and play all the different styles and make them fit, mm -hmm. whether it's um, Oliver or Muggsy Spanier or Keppard, Tommy Ladner or, or whatever. It's always uh -huh. the right thing. And that in, inspires me. When you've got a hot front line, you're not going to just sit there and take up space on the bandstand. You want to make it go. Gee, I wonder if those bands ever do the wagon thing anymore. Where they put the band on the wagon and they go out. And <laughs> what a great idea! Yeah, well, they used to do that to advertise where they were playing. Sure, that's where the phrase "on the wagon" came from. And you know, tailgate, and also tailgate the trombone. trombone hanging over the back. Yeah. I'd love to play a job like that. <laughs> I, I got a chance to play a parade down there, and for oh. weeks, and, and this fellow Chris is also a fine drummer. We were going to play drums, bass drum and snare drum. We studied Bunk's brass band and the Eureka Brass Band. We got all our sequence of parade beats down, ready to go, couldn't wait. Oh boy, finally we're going to play a real parade in New Orleans. And we got down on the street literally rubbing our hands yeah. and waiting for the leader <laughs> to uh, give us the cue to bring it in. And he just picked up his clarinet and just started playing the Saints. Uh -huh. Too fast to march to. Uh -huh. Oh, bummer. I've had one parade since then. It did work. It, it was a lot more in yeah. the tradition. But yeah, I'd love to play something like that on a, on a horse-drawn wagon or something. Disneyland used to do that. Mm -hmm. Their main parade at Dixieland at Disneyland was down Main Street in horse-drawn wagons. That's where I heard Kid Ori play. Yeah. You've uh, done quite a bit of band leading. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest headache in being a band leader? <sighs> Big, biggest thing to surmount? Coordinating everyone's schedules. Yeah. Because every nobody can give their loyalty to one band. So when I, for instance, with the Roadrunners, Bobby Gordon's got his regular job in San Diego. Now it's only two nights a week. But he also works with Marty Gross and the Orphan Newsboys and plays jazz parties as a solo. So I've got to coordinate that. Uh, Rebecca works all the time in Portland as a uh, freelance and with Dave Frischberg, and she's on this jazz party circuit. So that's enough right there. Then the other two guys are school teachers. Oh. And well, gee, I well, four days, yeah, I can't really take off that long. So that's a problem. Then it, as soon as you start having subs, it changes the repertoire, it changes the sound, it changes everything. Yeah. So the logistics are the worst part of it. And now you're going to be even more spread out because you're well, I will. They won't. they won't. I mean, it'll be one airfare from Gulfport, Mississippi now, uh -huh. instead of uh, all of us being on in, in a straight line down the West Coast. But if somebody wants the band enough, then yeah. they'll be able to pay that airfare, I would think. Yeah. I hope. Right. But I think that's the worst headache. I mean, none of it's important when you're up there playing and having a good time and, and the people are reacting to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other terrible headache is if it doesn't go over. Yeah. But that's seldom. I mean, how could you how could you not like Rebecca's singing or right. Bobby's clarinet, you know? That's I can't imagine that happening. You had mentioned talk, talking about her that it was nice to work with as you described a, a singer who's a musician. Yes. Are yes. there singers that aren't musicians? There are singers who don't play other instruments. Uh-huh. They they they'll know the chords on the piano or uh how to transpose, you know, musical uh, knowledge that, that everyone should have, but they don't think in instrumental terms. 
they're not thinking, okay, the band has just played a slow tune and now they're bringing me on. I'd better do something up tempo to bring the, mm -hmm. you know, the excitement level back up. They think, okay, well, I need this chord here, and then this chord here, and then lead me in here, and I'll I'll come in at this tempo, and then bring it up slightly, and you can play this. And they don't think the crowd. By then, you've lost the crowd. Uh -huh. You've got to keep things going like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be hyper, but I don't like long gaps between tunes. I don't like discussing routines. I want to know what's going to happen before we get on the stand. Yeah. And that's why a singer like Rebecca, she's, she's thinking that same way. Well, we better keep it moving. So if there's any question about uh, the chords on the verse or the setup, she'll say, let's just start on the chorus, guitar and brushes, I'll just, I'll sing it. And just makes it easy and mm -hmm. keeps things moving along. That's where a musician as a vocalist is very handy. Cool. What's um, in the future <clears throat> as far as uh, you're joining a band down there. Mm -hmm. Any other opportunities in, in our surrounding New Orleans that... Yeah, there's a lot of casual work. Um, parties, weddings, mm -hmm. things like that. And substitute work. Mm -hmm. You know, there, some of the places go five days a week. Some, one of the clubs has a shift of three bands on weekends. And sometimes people just get burned out and they want time off or they, they're going on vacation or something like that. So if I'm there, I'll get a call. Mm -hmm. And uh, recording work, too. <clears throat> One of the labels I've done extensive recording for, Jazzology and GHB, is based in New Orleans. And when I lived there before, I got the first call as a session drummer. Uh -huh. So I would imagine I'll get that again. You've been on a lot of records already. Yeah, I, th I think it's something like 125, uh -huh. counting videos and, yeah. and audio tapes and CDs and things like that. With the um, small labels, they pretty much pay you a, a set fee yeah. for your session. And you have to be on RCA or Sony, CBS, Verve, something like that to get any kind of residuals. Right. I, I've gotten uh, payments from the recording manufacturers yes. fund, but that's the only kind of residuals I ever get unless I buy product at a discount and resell it on a job. Then you can make a little more mm. that way. Yeah. You know, we get an artist discount when we buy a CD. Right. So we're not paying full price, but still we may have to pay a local tax on it or pay someone to handle it. So by the time I wind up with 750 to split five ways. None of us are getting rich on a CD sale. It's a crazy business. But I keep making them anyway. I mean, I mean I've made some I'm really, really proud of, and uh -huh. in all different styles that I can play. I've done just about every drum style that I can play. Uh -huh. A couple I've missed, but I, I imagine think, I'll get to them. I think you might be. Does this sound familiar to you? Uh, I recognize my splash symbol. Yeah. It, that's your splash that's symbol. That's my splash symbol. I only know a couple other guys who would play it like that. So. <laughs> that's a Rick Fay session for yeah. Arbors. Yeah. Now, on a session like this, I would imagine they're fairly, budget-wise, you're fairly tight with studio time. That one wasn't. Actually, Arbor's doesn't, uh, doesn't do that to musicians. That's nice. Matt Dahmer's very loose about studio time. He doesn't want the music to be forced. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's very fair in that respect. And so you get in there and you do a run-through and... You can do a run through and, and a couple of takes. I mean, I, I don't think any uh, producer would want you to do the rehearsal in the studio and then do multiple takes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want you to have an idea of what you're going to do before you go in. But if it's a specially assembled band that's never seen the music, unless everybody's an ace sight reader, you're going to need some rehearsal time. Yeah. Right. And there's never, with this kind of music, there's never overdubbing or... Oh, sure. Oh, no kidding. Oh, sure, yeah. 
So they isolate people in the, in the Not studio? so much, no. What uh, we've done a lot on sessions I've been involved in is if there's a vocal, for instance, where you don't want to sing it oh. live, uh, you lay down the accompaniment beforehand. Mm -hmm. I mean, say it's Rebecca. Anyone that I would have on a recording session would know how she sings and her phrasing. Like Chris Tile, the trumpet player, he'd lay down the accompaniment, then she can come in later with headphones and lay down the track. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. You don't like to do that, but uh, there's times when with brass or something, it might be too loud for her to hear herself. Yeah. And the ISO booth doesn't. I hate that. Yeah. You know, if you can't have everybody grouped together in a studio like you would play on a bandstand, that's trouble just waiting to happen. Because uh -huh. you can't make the eye contact or little hand signals or something to uh, that might save a performance otherwise. Right. But there is a there is a fair amount of overdubbing and clipping on of endings. And now you can do it with a computer. Yeah. And just match up the sound waves of the cymbal crash and uh, no one will ever know. <laughs> I'll know, right. but yeah. they won't. <laughs> right, that's okay. How do you feel about the future of, of this music? This, well, I'm not sure what I mean by this music, but... Well, this pre-bebop pre music? Yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm worried to the point of ulcers about it. Yeah. Because as our audience gets older, I don't see a younger one coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of youth education programs to teach young people to play this music. I don't know who they're going to play it for. I don't know of music appreciation courses or even public concerts to uh, get more people interested in, in a style from Buddy Bolden to yeah. Bunny Berrigan. I mean, the kids are going to have to find it on their own and say, wow, I'd like to play trumpet like that. And then in 2025, I'll say, good luck. I hope someone's there to listen to it. Yeah. That really worries me. I mean, you, you can see the age of the audience here. Yep. And they're great supporters. They go to all these things. They buy the recordings. They're the salt of the earth. But when they're gone, I don't know. It's the same with the jazz festivals that I play on the West Coast, the Dixieland festivals, an older crowd. Mm -hmm. If you add other music to bring in a younger crowd, you can add Zydeco and blues and uh, Cajun music and things like that. But that's not jazz. Yeah. That's not teaching them to appreciate uh, Freddie Keppard or Bix or Earl Hines. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Except music appreciation courses starting right now in uh -huh. as many places as possible. Right. Because there will always be someone who will say, well, I like that. I don't care to play it. You know, I'd rather fiddle with my computers, but I like the music and I'd go to hear it. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I hope that yeah. turns out that way. Yeah, we, need, we definitely need more audience. Yeah. And it's, it's different overseas. Yeah. It really is. There's so many more people who really appreciate the music and know about it over there. And that's not changed since the 20s. The first books on yeah. jazz were from Europe. Right. We had a lot of our jazz musicians booking over there. Sure. You know. and, and they stayed there forever. I mean, they were the black musicians who went there were treated like human beings and didn't have mm -hmm. to look over their shoulder every time. And they had long and productive lives. Sidney Bechet mm -hmm. is a god in France mm -hmm. still. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's too bad that in his own country he couldn't be treated that way. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping you don't have to move over there. You Mississippi is about as far yeah. as I want to go. Okay, you can go for a visit, but... Uh, I'll come back. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. And I hope you have a productive set tonight. I know you have to go and do your little talk-through rehearsal. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Best of luck in your new environment. Thank you. Down in the home of jazz. I hope to see you again. And likewise, thanks so much. Yep.